all you peoples. Welcome, this is Bill Donahue with Discerning Truths, and Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't Hog telling me I was muted. I actually got it, you know. So um, let me let me back up a minute. So welcome to everybody. This is uh, this is Bill Don here with Discerning Truths. And uh, Monday, Wednesday, I teach the uh, that uh, book in the Bible, and then on Friday, I try to do something different. I've started a new series. Uh, that's looking at some myths, um, popular myths, and trying to separate them from fact. And today I'm going to deal with a couple myths that are in, uh, actually taught in seminaries. Um, the What is called the JDP and the Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis. And I'm also going to look at um, some myths taught about the flood in Genesis 6-8. So uh, I'm going to hit those as we go through this, but before we uh, take off with our study, I always try to take care of business. And uh, when I'm not muted, <laughs> there we go. So uh, I did receive a, a couple books in the mail, and thank you uh, for the people that sent them. And um, remember, you got to use uh, the the Lahui address and put on it the suite 1300 number 164. 164 is my box in that suite, and uh, you want to get it to me, I need them both on there, even if your mailing program doesn't like the address. Use the address I provided. Uh, emails go to bill at discerningtruths.com. I love the emails I get. Uh, sometimes I get them from people I don't even know are listening, which is great. I have all my replays up on uh, Cloud Hub, and I have the link here. But if you go on Cloud Hub and just search for channel 217, you can find my channel and then go through and scroll through the uh, shows. I try to put a title screen on and a, uh, a de description of what it's about. You can see what interests you. And then, um, what do you call it? The show notes, always after, I put a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A PDF of anything that's up here on the on the screen and post it on the Discerning Truth group on Telegram. Um, like I said, you can uh, reach me at Discerning Truth on Telegram, but I don't check those messages very often. Your better way to talk to me is at Bill at DiscerningTruth.com. You said Monday and Wednesday, I just teach the Bible, and I I'm going through the Book of John, the Gospel of John, right now. And on Friday, I try to do something different. On Tuesdays, I join Neil. That ha those broadcasts are all Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon Pacific time. On Tuesday, I join Neil's stream. She usually starts at ten twenty, ten twenty five ish Central time, and then I usually join her fifteen thirty minutes into the um, um, stream, and we talk about whatever's on Neil's mind or. If she has, she asked me if something's on my mind, and we'll just have a chat. And her and I have a Zoom call that you get to listen to, and make comments on. And and we love uh, comments from the um, chat. I start my day with my good friend uh, Michael Beatty, Miguel California. We usually get up after he's, his podcast is done, so I, he does it at five thirty a.m. Pacific time. And it's 3.30 here in, in Hawaii. So when I wake up, 
I listen to a podcast while I'm having coffee, start my day off with a little worship, some Proverbs, and, and the study in Nehemiah has been uh, just amazing. And then Michael has turned into quite the prayer warrior on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Usually I'm just going off the air. He comes on with his uh, Bend a Knee podcast and does a prayer for the nation. And uh, really great. And then on Sunday morning, his wife Linda joins him and uh, they go through the Psalms. And if you're not listening to Michael, you're you're missing out. Okay. So uh, with that, I had put up a partial list of some of the, the uh, what do you call it, myths I'm going to deal with. And there's way more than on this slide. I mean, was Jesus married to Mary Magdalene? Did they have kids? There's just a big conspiracy theory up here that the Catholic Church has been hiding. and all kind of, I'll deal with a bunch of the myths. But last weekend, I, I kind of went with this basic idea that Christianity borrowed material from pagan myths. This is taught in seminaries. It is very popular in liberal Christianity. It's the assumed truth behind things like uh, I put up the books Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and the Da Vinci Code. There's so much, so much material out here that starts with this assumption. And last Friday, I I try to drive a stake through the heart that there's no basis for this. Okay. And today I'm going to deal with a couple more myths taught in seminary the JDP theory, and I'll explain what it is, but basically it says that the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, were not written by Moses. They were written by four different authors or, or groups of authors and redacted many times in the books we have now. Um, and then there's another theory associated with that called the Deutero-Isaiah theory. There's also a Tretero-Isaiah that Isaiah had at least two, maybe three authors and uh, and only one was actually Isaiah, the first 39 chapters. And I'm going to deal with that. And then um, the flood of Noah, the, being a local flood that was over there in, in just a little valley and not a global flood, these are three of the things that I think I can deal with in this stream. And, uh, but I'm going to go over time if I don't get started. So let's just start out with the idea that... Um, this Pentateuch was not written by Moses, right? So in brief, the JEDP theory states that the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, were not written entirely or at all. Some people say he wrote parts of them, but not all of them. Now, I absolutely agree that some things were ad added by scribes, like Moses' description of his own death and burial. I'm pretty sure Moses didn't write that. But the idea that these books in general were not at the hand of Moses is um, the theory. And, and the JDP is just an acronym. And they're using J for uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, okay, Yahweh. It's a German pronunciation of the, of the Hebrew letter. And from what we get the word Yahweh, and when the Germans added the uh, vowel points from Adonai into the word, and then they pronounce the Y as a J, that's where you get the name Jehovah. So the first letter stands for J, and it's because Jehovah is God's name used in parts of those books. The Elohist used the title Elohim for God, right? And the Deuteronomist is the author of Deuteronomy they see as totally separate. And then the priestly author of a Leviticus, that somebody from the priest class wrote Leviticus and it wasn't Moses. That's their theory. And it, it uh, goes on to state that different portions of the Pentateuch were likely compiled in the 4th century BC, uh, possibly by Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries, and they think Ezra might have done this. Uh, there is some evidence that Ezra made some copies from the old Hebrew, what's called Proto-Hebrew, into what was then uh, the Hebrew used in the day, that Ezra did that. The idea that Ezra redacted the books or did any of that, it, it just doesn't, it's not supported. You, you don't jump from one conclusion to the other. And the theory is based on, that should be the fact, right? 
that the Bible uses different names and titles for God. Uh, there are also changes in the style of writing. This theory is taught in seminaries, and its assumptions appear directly or indirectly in many academic papers. So just understand, you get into Christian scholarship, they're going to assume this is true, right? Now, we've already seen other authors in the book use amanosis, am, amanosis, scribes, literary assistants, okay? People that write down the words, and they're not taking di dictation the way we would think of dictation, but they listen to the speaker and they write it down, and then the speaker approves the writing. So we saw Paul and Peter and, and uh, different writers in the New Testament have used these and they're clearly evident they use them. If Moses used literary assistants to write these five books, the difference in style is easily explained by the use of those amanuses. You don't have to come up with an idea that Moses isn't the author. Now, the, the most powerful argument against this JEDP theory is in the Bible itself. In Mark 12, 26, Jesus said, Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses? Okay, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Therefore, Jesus plainly uh, taught that Jesus wrote the account. Uh, that should say taught. I'm going to fix it right now as we go on. Sorry. That Moses wrote the account of the burning bush in Exodus, right? Luke in Acts 3.22 comments on a passage out of Deuteronomy 18.15 and credits Moses as being the author of that passage, not some other author of Deuteronomy. Paul in Romans 10.5 talks about the righteous Moses described in Leviticus 18.5. Paul therefore testifies that Moses, Moses is the author of Leviticus. So we have Jesus showing that Moses was the author of Exodus, Luke showing that uh, Moses wrote Deuteronomy, and Paul saying that Moses is the author of Leviticus. In order for the JEDP theory to be true, Jesus, Luke, and Paul must either be liars or in error in their understanding of the Old Testament. Let us put our faith in Jesus and the human authors of Scripture rather than the ridiculous and baseless JDP theory that is popular among theologians. And if it's a choice between the Bible and Jesus and the apostles and some theologians' theory, you're going to see me side with the Bible every time. Okay? So, uh, this idea of this Deutero Isaiah theory or second Isaiah is what that means, comes, came about near the end of the 18th century, okay? So for 18 centuries, we believed Isaiah wrote Isaiah, or actually for 700 years before that, so about 25 centuries, we believed Isaiah wrote it. But supposedly, Isaiah himself wrote the first 39 chapters, leaving one of his students to write the second part, chapters 40 to 66 sometime after the Babylonian captivity, and the Babylonian captivity started around 586 BC. This later date would explain the explicit mention of Cyrus the king of Persia in Isaiah 42, 28 to 45, 51, without requiring predictive prophecy. See, by making his student write this instead of Isaiah, then that prophecy about uh, Cyrus coming is not prophecy, it's history. Do you see how that this downgrades scripture? The claim that though it's a single book with a single name, the author of Isaiah 40 to 66 is not the same author of the first 39 chapters. And indeed, many scholars discern a third hand in Isaiah 56 to 66. Okay. So that's where you get the Tretero Isaiah theory, where there's three of them. But Deutero Isaiah theory, theory claims that Isaiah 40 to 55 contain no personal details of the prophet Isaiah compared to the first 39 chapters, which Isaiah talks about himself or, or personal uh, references regularly. 
The first section tells of numerous stories of Isaiah, especially his dealings with kings and others in Jerusalem. This theory goes on to say that the style and the language of 40 to 55 seems to be quite different than earlier chapters. Like I said, easily explained if you have a different literary uh, assistant doing those chapters, right? Like the JEDP theory hypothesis, the multiple author hypothesis for Isaiah is taught in seminaries and discussed in academic papers, but both in the Christian and Jewish community. But is it true, right? You get these ivory tower theologians that have bought into this theory and they, they talk about it and they spread this word. And when your pastors go to seminary to learn, they are taught this. But is it true? Okay. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain a complete scroll of Isaiah. There's actually a second one nearly complete, but the complete scroll of Isaiah dates to about the second century BC. The book is one unit. And with the end of 39 chapters and the beginning of 40 is one continuous column of text. There's not even a, a pause in the text. There is a break between chapter 33 and 34. Be, and what they think is Isaiah was originally on two scrolls with one through 33 on the first scroll and 34 through 66 on the second scroll. That's about the midway point between in the book of Isaiah. It makes sense that it was originally two smaller scrolls and they put it together as one scroll in what's called the great scroll of Isaiah. But there is absolutely no evidence in that 2nd century B.C. copy of Isaiah, that there is a break between 39 and 40. Okay? But, again, we'll go to the Bible itself. Jesus quoting from Isaiah 29, 13, and he says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain in their teachings, are but rules taught by men. Now, Jesus quotes this in Mark 7, 6, and 7. But notice where he's quoting from. He's quoting from Isaiah 29, which these uh, theologians say Isaiah actually wrote. And then, But Jesus also referenced Isaiah 42, 1 through 4 in Matthew 12, 17. There was uh, to fulfill what was spoken through by the prophet Isaiah. So Jesus himself says that that, reference to Isaiah 42 is from the prophet Isaiah, not from a second hand. And Isaiah is also referenced in Matthew 8, 16 and 17 by quoting Isaiah 53. This is fulfillment of what was spoken through by the prophet Isaiah. He took upon our infirmities and carried our diseases. So now we have three sections of Isaiah, all attributed to the prophet Isaiah of uh, by both New Testament writers and by Jesus himself. Now, Jesus is the one and only omniscient God in the tent of human flesh. Okay? He is not only all-knowing, but he's the embodiment of truth. He says Isaiah wrote the whole book. I choose to side with Jesus against the theologians. And I'm suggesting that you do the same thing. That there's all these theological theories out there and they make it out of the seminaries and they make it on to um, popular podcasts and, and stuff. But I'm telling you, when you look at the Bible, they don't hold water. Okay? The other thing that comes out here is that the idea that Noah's flood was a local flood that was turned into a story of global judgment as some kind of morality play. Okay? And I'm going to give you a sample of the evidence that they cite in favor of this idea, and then I'm going to refute it, okay? The Bible in Genesis 6 to 9 describes a worldwide flood called the Noah Noachian flood, covering even the highest mountains of the earth and the construction of a huge boat, a rectangular box-sized lake scraft that transported animals, at least two of a kind, and all land animals on the earth. The Quran in Surahs 11 and 71 has almost a duplicate story and a similar huge boat and transported animals in a worldwide flood. 
In addition, two older stories exist in ancient Babylon epics that describe a huge flood. One is the Epic of Gilgamesh, describing the flood in the Euphrates River. The other is the Epic of Anthras, which has a huge flood on the Tigris River. While Genesis says that this flood was intended by God to destroy all flesh on earth, Genesis 6.13, and because sedimentary rocks on all continents contain fossils that supposedly represent the destroyed flesh of all life, it might be thought that the Bible story describing a whole earth flood was true. However, interlayered with these fossil-bearing sedimentary rocks on the continents are layers of evaporate rock, salt, sodium chloride, gypsum, um, and and hydrate, and various potash and magnesium salts, which are associated with red beds or shales containing fossilized mud cracks. And this is from uh, Schreiber and others in 2007. And what they're saying is that intermixed with these fossils that are put down in the mud are layers that appear to be formed in the dry. They're formed in the period when it's drying, and you can't have them intermixed if it's one global flood. You have to have multiple flood, a flood, a drying period, another flood, and that that's more, better explained by local floods, multiple local floods, right? Many of these mineral compounds in the red beds have combined thickness on different continents of more than one kilometer, right? And uh, the uh, that's over 3,000 feet, right? You know? No. That, that can't be right. That, I don't know what that a kilometer is, 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 is not 3,000 feet, I don't think. And I'm, I'm lost here. The red beds are red because they contain red hermitite, iron oxide, which formed from the magnetic grains that were oxidized while the muds were exposed to oxygen in open air. Here, here's your point. The mud cracks can be only formed only under a drying condition that causes the mud to shrink and form a polygonal cracks. The evaporative mineral compounds in the layers are deposited in the correct chemical order pre uh, predicted by the solubility of each kind of ion in these compounds and whose increasing concentrations during the evaporation of water would cause them uh, to precipitate in predictable deposit, deposit, depositional sequence of water volume decrease. Such evaporative deposits would be expected to occur where a marine sea was once present and to disappear when the sea became completely dry. Therefore, one could expect these evaporates to be on top of the supposed Noachian flood deposits when the water supposedly receded and the land dried out, but certainly not in different levels in between the older and younger, younger fossiliferous flood deposits. So this is their argument, their scientific argument against it, a, a global flood. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue with, with more of their arguments, right? And they're looking at two rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris. These are the ones mentioned in the Babylonian flood stories. Flow through Mesopotamia, which is now the country of Iraq. There are several layers of exposed rocks near these two rivers in the south eastern Mesopotamia, Iraq, that are likely flood deposits. Most are about uh, 0.3 meters thick, and one is, is as much as 3 meters thick. And that's from McDonald, 1998. Flood debris in the same thick deposits along the Euphrates River near the ancient Sumerian city of Shurapak, about 200 kilometers southeast of Baghdad, has been dated by C14 methods, carbon-14, given the age of 2900 BC, okay? And then flood deposits 2.4 meters thick were also reported in McDonald as far in northeast in the Babylonian city of Kish, uh, that's 120 kilometers south of Baghdad. At any rate, the many flood deposit layers show that flooding in southeastern Mesopotamia was not unusual in ancient times. Similar large local floods are common throughout history around the world. For example, monsoon storms in Bangladesh frequently produce much rain over the country in the Himalayan mountains, which rise northern part in the country, run off water and rain, and melting snows during such storms create great floods in four rivers that converge on the Wang River, uh, when, which then drains into the huge delta of the Bay of Bengal. 
Thousands of people have been drowned in the Delta regions by many such flooding in the last century. Almost every culture throughout history has a flood story to tell, as would be the people of Bangladesh. But each of these times and places, the floods would have been local and not worldwide. And my answer is big deal. Just because there's a Noah's flood, a global flood, that does not exclude the possibility of other local floods from being there. You, you can't... Um, you can't expect that just because there's a global flood, there, there are no more local floods. That would be the fact, okay? So what they're saying here is they have evidence of local floods, therefore there's no global flood. That, that's nonsensical. Of course you, you're going to have evidence. And yes, you could have additional fossils created in the local floods, but it doesn't mean that you don't have a global flood. That doesn't work. That argument is, is nonsense. But this is where they, they teach this. And I'm going to tell you, many seminaries teach that this local flood theory or that the Jews borrowed the flood merit narrative from the Mesopotamian text, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, to write a morality play about the judgment of God. A number of Christian ministries also teach the idea of a local flood. Okay? They claim that from a scientific perspective, the universal flood and uh, flood geology and a canopy theory is entirely without support. But is there evidence for a global flood? You know, you're going to tell me that um, there's no evidence. Well, let's just take a look if there is some evidence. We find fossils of sea creatures and rock layers that cover all the continents. For example, most of the rock layers in the walls of the Grand Canyon, more than a mile above sea level, contain marine fossils, fossilized shellfish, and even found in the Himalayas. How'd they get there in the Himalayas? How did marine sea creatures end up in the Himalayas to be fossilized? Unless the Himalayas were at one time underneath the sea. Right? When, did, when were they underneath the sea? Okay. We find extensive fossil graveyards and exquisitely preserved fossils. For example, billions of uh, nataloid fossils are found in a layer within the red wall limestone of the Grand Canyon. This layer was deposited catastrophically by a massive flow of sediment, most, mostly lime sand. The chalk and coal beds in Europe and the United States and the fish and I, I, ichthyosaurs, insects and other fossils around the world testify of a catastrophic destruction and burial. When you're getting vast number of fossils in the same place, all fossilized in relatively uh, good condition, that indicates they were buried in, in, at the same time in the mud and fossilized together. We find rock layers that can be traced all the way across the continents, even between continents, and physical features in those strata indicate they were deposited rapidly. For example, the Tapet sandstone, the red wall limestone in the, in the Grand Canyon can be traced across the entire United States, up into Canada, and even into the Atlantic Ocean to England. The chalk beds in England, the White Cliffs of Dover, can be traced across Europe into the Middle East and can be found in the mid Midwest of the United States and in the Western Australia. Inclined sloping layers within the uh, Coconino sandstone of the Grand Canyon are also testimony to a 10,000 cubic miles of sand being deposited by huge water currents within days. Okay? Number four, we find that the sediments in those widespread, rapidly deposited rock layers had to be eroded from distant sources and carried long distance by fast-moving water. For example, the sand in the Coconino sandstone of the Grand Canyon in Arizona had to be eroded and transported from the northern portion of what is now the United States and in Canada. Furthermore, water currents indicate, such as ripple marks, 
preserved in the rock layers show that naturalists claim to have been there for over 300 million years. Water currents were occasionally formed from the northeast to southwest across the North and South America, which of course is only possible over weeks of a period of a global flood. Okay, we find evidence of rapid erosion and even no erosion between rock layers. Uh, flat knife edge boundaries between rock layers indicate continuous deposition of one layer after another with no time for erosion. For example, there is no evidence of any missing or millions of years of erosion in a flat boundary between two well-known layers of the Grand Canyon, the Coconina Sandstone and the Hermit Formation. Another impressive example of flat boundaries at Grand Canyon and, and Redwall Limestone and the strata beneath it. And the Grand Canyon is a great example to prove uh, Christian flood geology. It absolutely supports our position 100%. Rocks do not normally bend, they break because they are hard and brittle. But in many places we find whole sequences of strata that were bent without fracturing, indicating that the, all the rock layers were rapidly deposited and folded while they were still wet and pliable before the final hardening. For example, the Tapiat sandstone in the Grand Canyon is folded at a right angle, 90 degrees, without evidence of breaking, yet this folding could only have occurred after the rest of the layer had been deposited, supposedly over 480 million years. The rock would have been hard within 480 million years and would have broke. And while the tapiat sandstone remained wet and pliable is when this had to be bent. Again, evidence that happened quickly, right? And I know this is a lot of this is science. I'm just trying to I'll have my notes and they're going to be on PDF. You can check these. Scientists claim that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago and weren't victims of the flood, but we have found soft tissue and red blood cells in dinosaur bones that were originally thought to be fossils. There is no way for soft tissue and especially red blood cells to have been preserved over millions of years. Those bones that are not fossils, but actual bones with soft tissue had to be preserved. They, they, you cannot date them back millions of years, and even naturalists agree that's not possible. So they, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the soft tissue discovery in a little bit more in, in a little while. But Mount St. Helens disproved many assumptions, and I bolded the word assumption promoted by naturalists in science. Okay. People that start out with a naturalistic worldview that everything happened by nature, this all happened, it was a big bang, you went through all these millions or billions of years, and then you finally get to man and you had evolution, they start with those assumptions. They don't leave even a possibility that the Bible is true. That's their starting assumption and their working premise. But we had an, uh, an experience in Mount St. Helens where the side of the mountain blew out, blew down a bunch of trees, but it created a dam with the, um, what was blown out the side of the mountain created a dam. It, it built up a bunch of water on the, on the mountain. The dam broke and then, and the water came down the mountain. And in a matter of days, it cut a scale model of the Grand Canyon in the, coming out of the Mount St. Helens. Not years, not a, a, a stream or a river running for millions and thousands of years cut it. No, it got cut in days because it was a massive amount of water moving at, at a good clip down the mountain. Exactly what creationists claim caused the, uh, the Grand Canyon on a smaller scale because the amount of water coming off of Mount St. Helens is not the same amount of water as running off of the North American continent uh, down through the Grand Canyon out to the south and the west, okay? We also found in Spirit Lake up there at uh, Mount St. Helens, trees that were blown into the water and floated root ball down. And because of the amount of silica sand in that that was dumped into Spirit Lake in the acidic level of the lake post-volcanic eruption, those trees petrified in months. Not millions of years, months they petrified. They are found 
standing up exactly like the petrified forest that we find around the world. So again, the Mount St. Helens example proves the Bible idea. It, it fits it. It doesn't prove it, but it fits the model presented in the Bible. And then I know they liked it, only mentioned the Babylonian epics, and, or, or not Babylonian, Mesopotamian texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh. But China, the Chinese records of a first dynasty that scientists said was mythological, okay? Until they start making archaeological discoveries. And their, their record of their first dynasty is that of the Z, I, I don't know how to pronounce Chinese names, the XIA, contains the story of a great flood, a Noah-like savior, an Emperor Yu who gained the mandate of heaven after uh, dredging canals to dispel the floodwaters and make the land safe, a team of archaeologists and geologists led by uh, Qing Long Wu of Peking University in Beijing has now discovered evidence of a massive flood that they say could be the great flood mentioned in the Chinese annals. Radiocarbon dating of the bones of three children killed by the... Uh, they believe this flood was created by an earthquake, okay? That they're dating these bones from the uh, thing in the 1920 BC. Well, radiocarbon dating is not uh, as accurate as they want you to believe, but suddenly we're getting a date for a flood that killed people in China that is rapidly approaching the date for the flood in the Bible, okay? If the flood occurred but was merely local in its extent, one would not expect a record uh, of the limited event to have been passed down in separate societies worldwide. However, we find cultures having similar records of a global flood all over the earth, not just China, South America, Mexico, okay, in the, in the, in the tribes. You have records of this flood in cultures all around the world because it is a common memory of the people that came out of the flood and you have the uh the nations that dispersed out of the uh, family of noah and they told that flood story over and over again and i'm sure the details got changed over the years and that the names are changed and the in the uh, name of their god whoever god they're serving at the time comes in there but the basic idea of a global flood is taught in almost every culture the objections raised that where did the waters go? But both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans have physical evidence in the ocean floors that match the idea that waters burst first from the bottom. And the flood story doesn't just say it rained. It talks about a firmament breaking. Firmament is likely an ice dome that was around the earth. And that ice dome breaks up, it comes down and falls as water. You have fountains of the deep that burst through their water. You had water coming from above and below, and then uh, the rain. So what happens when all this water shoots out from underneath the ground? You create a, a cavity in the ground where the water used to be. And then the ground is going to collapse back into that cavity when you have uh, done it. But it, it is called rapid subduction, that the ground goes down quickly. And uh, you have evidence of big... Uh, Atlantic Rift, uh, where it looks like the ocean floor was ripped open and, and spliced back together. And then in the Pacific Ocean, you have the Mariana Trench. It alone is 35,000 feet deep at its depth. It could easily, if that level was 10,000 feet before the flood, that's ample area for all the water to have gone into the ocean. So the idea of where the water went is... I mean, you're blind if you can't see that there's evidence right here that the water could easily go in the ocean, right? If we assume that God did not create life through gradual evolution, since creation and the flood was a primary global catastrophic event, and catastrophic events are generally the cause of fossilization, we know that the following would be predicted. So if you don't start with the idea that evolution is true, and you don't start with naturalistic assumptions, and you just understand that the Bible teaches a global flood, and that flood, the this catastrophic events are what we know causes fossils to occur, 
then you can make these predictions based on the biblical model that very few fossils likely would have been formed prior to the flood, right? That transitional fossils between major phylogenic groups would be non-existent in a fossil record. That instead, living creatures would appear fully formed, distinct, and functional at the first time they appear in the fossil record. And when the global flood began, we would predict a significant marker in the geological common that represents the commencement of a worldwide flood event. We would further predict an explosion of fully formed fossils aft above the lime worldwide, representing the deaths of all living creatures due to mudslides and other fossil forming processes during a global event. All of these predictions match the evidence that we have. So the predictions made from a biblical model match the evidence here. And I'm going to deal with the evidence that they talked about, about uh, inner layer drive models in, in just a minute. Now, most of the information I provided you, both for and against, is easily available off of websites. You don't have to read a lot of books and do all this stuff. This stuff is available. On the next few slides, I'm going to show you experts from a book. And the book's by Daniel A. Biddle. And his book's called Debunk and Seven Myths That Deny the Historicity of Genesis, Creation, and Noah's Flood. Excellent book. Uh, I also, I think this is available online. And the book contains far more information than I have time to share here. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you these slides to just give you a little bit of the science. Because I know a lot of us slept through science class and, and didn't really pay that much attention. So the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is what I was talking about where it looks like the Atlantic Ocean, the ocean floor was ripped in half and then put back together. It's the longest mountain range in the entire world and includes a perpendicular faults along its entire length. It's known as transition faults, showing the formation of a new seafloor involved a pulling apart of the ocean basin. The sharpness of the faults and the abrupt edges indicate that little time has expired since their formation. The raised and sloped feature on each side of the rift also testify to a hot and buoyant rock that still lies beneath it. And from a biblical stand standpoint, the formation of the Atlantic Basin occurred quickly during the flood and then slowly uh, slowed down greatly about an inch per year. And the GPS me measurements indicate today that that's exactly what we find. Okay. On the Pacific side, the Ring of Fire is about a 25,000 mile horseshoe-shaped string of oceanic trenches in the Pacific Ocean Basin where 90% of the world's earthquakes and a large frac fraction of the world's volcanics occur. It's also where most of the plate subduction is taking place today. From a biblical perspective, this long belt of volcanoes and earthquakes marks the location where a vast amount of the ocean plate was rapidly subducted into the Earth's interior during the flood. Today, by comparison, the speed of subjection is extremely slow, and the resulting earthquakes and tsunami are distractively, uh, distract dramatically less frequent. So that brings up the idea of tsunamis. If you had this level of geologic activity, the tsunamis would have been enormous, okay? A major consequence of rapid plate motion is the generation of huge number of giant tsunamis. In today's world, at an ocean trench where the oceanic plate is steadily slipping into the mantle, the adjacent overriding plate generally is locked against it and is bent downwards and the other plate slides into the mantle. As this motion proceeds, the overriding plate is deformed more and more in a spring-like manner until the stress limit is exceeded. At this point, the two plates unlock, a significant slip between the plates occurs, and the overriding plate returns to its original shape. Such an unlocking and slip event usually produces an earthquake, you bet. If the slip event is large enough, it can also cause a tsunami. During the flood, when the plate speeds were a billion times higher than today, and I don't know about the billion, but they're going to be much higher. It's almost certain that the same uh, locking and unlocking phenomena was 
also prevailed. The higher plate speed that the huge amount of seafloor recycled into the mantle would have generated vast number of huge tsunami. Conservative estimates are in the range of 50,000 to 100,000 or more tsunamis with wave heights in the range of hundreds of feet or higher. So when it starts talking about there's not enough water to cover the whole earth, well, that water wasn't laying flat, right? That water was moving. And he includes a uh, uh, description. Now, this is from John Bungartner in his book. And um, it's just being copied here in this book. But it, it basically explains and in, in, uh, gives you a picture format of how tsunamis are created in the ocean floor. And so if you can imagine those moving at rapid speeds, not at um, just a... a quick little move of a few feet but moving hundreds of feet rapidly you can imagine the tsunamis that would have been created right where am i at okay then we have sediment de deposits numerical experiments were undertaken by dr bung governor to model the erosion and sediment deposit aspects in the sort of tsunami activity that show that readily capable of producing the observed continent sediment record. This work is described in a recent paper titled Understanding How the Flood, Flood Sediment Record Was Formed, the Role of Large Tsunamis. And that, that paper is by Bungartner. This figure shows a plot from the simulation that includes the plate motions, hence a third major result of rapid plate motion is the formation of observed, observed layer cake pattern in fossil bearing sediments across the continents. Now you got layers, right? You got layers and some of those layers may have been uh, at a drier period, okay? The next picture is what rapid subduction uh, does in in the leaves a temperature change okay and the striking temperature features in today's mantle blue representing very low temperature and red very high temperature in inferred temperature difference it's about three thousand degrees centigrade different but this is this is seriously hot the oceanic plates that rapidly subducted under the continents during the flood are still visible on our graphs today, seismic images of the mantle reveal a ring of unexpectedly cold rock at the bottom of the mantle beneath the subduction zone that surrounded by a Pacific Ocean. This, sub, this structure is obtained using a technique known as seismic tomography that folds together data from a 10,000 or more seismograms at once. So you take all these seismograms and then they meld the data into one uh, spot here. And I know I'm probably going to go over time, you know, if you're got to go, I understand that, but I'm, I'm trying to get through all this data for you. Okay. Now, one of their claims is they're talking about folds in the rock. Now you can see there's a person standing in this, in this thing and you see the wave like length in that rock. Rock doesn't bend in waves unless it's soft. And you can't explain this if these are layers of hard rock laid down that there would be fractures in them. It wouldn't be bent this way. And you see this folding all over the, uh, the world. The Genesis flood laid down tens of millions of cubic feet of sediment like sand and mud all over the globe. It soon hardened into rock. These layers contain most of the fossil record. Some of these massive layers are bent and even folded, providing they were uh, proven they were laid down rapidly and then bent before hardening into the rocks. Otherwise, they would have crumbled instead of bending. These folded and bent geological features are found all over the world and most occurred during the later stages of the flood when 80% of the world's mountains rapidly formed. Okay? There's a lot more going on with the flood than just a bunch of water. You're talking about gigantic geological changes are predicted around the world and that's the biblical story and that's what the evidence supports okay now what i noticed 
is that the books and articles and websites that were against the idea of a global flood failed to deal with any of the claimed evidence in support of the global flood model. They simply declared it to be non-existent, okay? And, and they poo-pooed it and dismissed it. I'm telling you, it, it's very uh, uh, aloof and looking down their nose at anybody that would even bring up the idea of a, a global flood. However, the people and organizations promoting the global flood model addressed and offered alternative explanations to most of the evidence to refute the globe that were provided to refute the global flood model. They provided an alternate explanation. So from a scientific point of view, I find that the global flood hypothesis best explains the available evidence. But people I know have lost their jobs for daring to publish material in scientific journals that run contrary to naturalistic worldview. Now, I'm going to give you one example. Mark Armitage was a published scientist who was fired by uh, the California State University at Northridge when he published his findings on the soft tissue and dinosaur bones. Okay, He published them under his name in a peer-reviewed journal, and they terminated him for it because it doesn't follow the, uh, the narrative they wanted to see, that naturalistic worldview. No, Mark eventually filed a wrong, wrongful termination suit against a university, which he won, and uh, all his findings have been confirmed by other scientists. So it wasn't just a one-off or some, some crazy guy creationist came up and came up with this uh, red blood cells in the, in the uh, bones that were supposed to be fossils. It's been done over and over again. There's now hundreds or maybe thousands of examples of soft tissue being found in what were previously thought to be fossils. You can't explain that with millions of years, right? Now, from a scriptural point of view, the Bible unequivocally teaches that the judgment called Noah's flood was global. The point of this presentation is to show that the evidence supports the Bible if you don't first exclude the possibility that the Bible might be true. If, if you come in with just the idea that naturalism could be true or the Bible could be true, right? And you're open to let the evidence lead where it goes, you're going to come to the conclusion that a global flood happened. If you start with a naturalistic worldview and belief in creation and eons in time and, and God created over evolution and it was a bunch of local floods and, it, and uh, the Bible is a bunch of myths made up by man. If you start with that assumption, you're going to end up with the conclusion that it's not true. Sorry, let's try this. Putting me on screen. So I kind of rushed through a lot of uh, material because I was trying to get this in without going too far over time. Um, give me a second and I'm going to go back and try to read the chat because I know some of you, your eyes roll back in your head. There's a bunch of scientific mumbo jumbo. Just hold with me that scientists who actually have looked at this material without excluding the possibility that the Bible is wrong have come up with evidence that, that actually confirms the Bible. Okay. Mm -hmm. And other people who assume the Bible is wrong uh, concluded that the Bible's wrong after their, uh, they did their research. Mm -hmm. Stand. 
And when troubles rise, you are always there. Okay, so uh, Debbie, yeah, Debbie Furby, I seen your comments about um, uh, wanting to purchase this for use in a school. Uh, my stuff's available for free, and you can use it any way you want. But uh, I'm going to look for a link to uh, Daniel Daniel A. Biddle as the author, and um, his book is called "Debunking the Seven Myths That Deny the Historicity of Genesis, Creation, and uh, Noah's Flood." Uh, excellent book. I believe it's available online. I will find it and I will drop a link in my uh, Discerning Truths group to that book and, and an online version of that book. Excellent resource for you if you have a, uh, 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 someone that's interested in this idea or uh, debunking the thing. It, it's a great resource. And uh, like I said, I don't agree with everything that almost anybody writes. But when you get a book that seems to be solid on a lot of different levels, I, I can endorse it, right? And uh, so those are those are there. And, and oh, I, I'm hoping you were joking that I broke up because I have no idea where I broke up. And all I can say is, uh, you know, you might have to uh, watch the video again and, and catch it. But uh, I, I never know what you, with your sense of humor if that was a joke or if I actually uh, broke up during part of this. And I do apologize for going so fast for the material, but I'm, I just, I knew I was under, uh, probably going to go overtime today, and I wanted to make sure I got this uh, done. And you can always watch the replay, go through the material again, download the PDF off of Discerning Truths Group, and uh, I'll put those links up again. Where am I at? At the Discerning Truths groups on Telegram, or or you can follow my Clout Hub link, and a replay will be available, and uh, do this. But understand clearly, there is a common theme, and it's the it's to undermine the, the Bible as a reliable Word of God. They're always doing it. You see me; I will tackle hard questions about the Bible. I tackle 
uh, the idea that there's uh, differences in the Gospels and, and all kinds of uh, stuff. And I, I fight against the fundamentalist idea like worship of the Bible. But that doesn't mean I don't have a high view of Scripture. And I have a high view of Scripture because it's proven itself to be true. And when people tell you that the science disproves it, it's not their science, it's their conclusions after they filter the science through their naturalistic worldview. And if you just take the evidence alone and say, I'm not buying into your naturalistic worldview, I want to see what this evidence actually says. The evidence fits the biblical model, fits the biblical model of creation, and it fits it of the flood. And the, and the problem I have is we now have Christians running major ministries and Christians teaching in major seminaries that say the flow of the flood of Noah never happened, that it was a local flood that we borrowed from the Babylonian text and that the Jews made up this story as a morality play. That's being taught. And if that's being taught in your seminaries, imagine what's getting to your churches. This, this is a critical time for the church because we are being infected and infected by false doctrine on every count. So with that, I'm going to end my rant for today. I'm already seven minutes over. And uh, God willing, I will see you on Monday. You know, let me get rid of this. Sorry, I gotta, I'm trying to find my outro and I'm, I'm pushing the wrong button. We'll see you then. Thank you.